Uh, today's lecturer is, is James Brockmore, uh, uh, who is Professor of Psychology and jo uh, Joseph and Elizabeth Robbie Collegiate Chair uh, in uh, the College of Arts and Letters. He's also the Associate Dean for the Social Sciences, uh, and his office is next to mine. Uh, I have heard him groaning and moaning and complaining um, and enjoying writing uh, the piece for you today uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Jim is, is uh, an extraordinarily successful uh, psychologist. Uh, his work is in the field of cognitive psychology uh, that, and vision science, and he's somebody who studies the cognitive and brain mechanisms underlying visual perception, attention, and memory. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Notre Dame, graduating in class of 1999, uh, and graduate work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then a postdoctoral fellowship at Michigan State. Uh, he had a faculty appointment at the University of Edinburgh, uh, in case you hadn't realized he's helpfully put on his notes, it's in Scotland, uh, and returned to Notre Dame in 2009, uh, initially as an associate professor, uh, now as a full professor and, and holder of a college chair. Uh, his research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, European Research Council, the UK's Economic and Social Research Council, and I totted up uh, just how much he has uh, earned in grants as PI and co-PI, and it's rapidly approaching $2 million. Uh, his list of publications is enormous. He now counts over 70 journal articles. Uh, and he is the co-author uh, of a textbook, uh, Sensation and Perception, now in its 10th edition. It is, he tells me, uh, far and away the biggest uh, uh, seller, the most widely adopted textbook in the whole field, uh, and has cornered 50% of the market. His topic today is magic of the mind, illusion, misdirection, and deception in our everyday lives. Jim Brocknell. Thanks, Peter. Well, good afternoon. Peter, you took my notes. Oh. <laughs> it's going to be a real short talk. That's the second time I've done that. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, the very uh, kind and generous uh, introduction, especially since my parents are here seeing me lecture for the very first time in my career. Um. All right, so we're here and we're going to talk about the psychology of magic. And I'm not a magician, but it seems appropriate that we at least start with one trick. My one, my only trick that is not going to ever see me on America's Got Talent, but it's good enough. All right. So I'm going to probably come down here to do this a little bit, just so you can see this a little bit better. All right, so I got a deck of cards here, so it's a card trick. Uh, I'm going to take the deck of cards out. We'll take the top two cards off the top of the deck, and we'll kind of walk around and let everybody see what my top two cards are. Is everybody OK? Do I need to go up the aisles? All right, so I need, well, my family's in the front row. I need volunteers I don't know, so I'm going to give you a card. Otherwise, it's cheating, right? Okay, I'm gonna fan these cards out. You're gonna put them wherever you want them. All right, just say stop. Stop. Well, not there. Oh. Not there, not there. <laughs> say stop. Stop. All right, that one's okay. All right. All right, you ready? Say stop. Stop. Okay, we're about to the end, man. You would like to wait. All right. Okay, so what we've done here is you've seen the cards, we've put the cards, we've hid them in the pile, and now my job is to find the cards that you just hid. This is the point as I'm walking out the door this morning and my daughter says, oh, you can do a trick? I said, yeah. She said, what if it doesn't work? So we're gonna be off to a really bad start. <laughs> okay, so what my job here is to find these cards. And so uh, kids, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of you have children out there and you ask your children to find something. So how do they do it? They make an enormous mess, but eventually they find what they're looking for. All right. This is the point when I do this in class that my TA is running up here to pick up the class. They're never sure what they're supposed to do. <laughs> All right. So uh, every magic trick, uh, whether it's a simple card trick performed by a college professor or an elaborate uh, illusion devised by David Copperfield, is really composed of two general components, a method and an effect. Effects concern the experiences of the audience. 
For example, we might see an object appear or vanish uh, with uh, no explanation, uh, move to another location with no apparent force, or transform into something entirely new, or be returned to its original condition after it's been transformed in some way. Now, in all these cases, magicians create a fantasy of impossibility that an audience is willing to accept to be real. And they do this by using a well-rehearsed set of methods. These may include special pieces of equipment, physical adeptness for sleight of hand, sensory experiences that distract us, or even the power of suggestion when naive audience members are asked to participate in the magic themselves. Now, our natural attraction to magic lies in our frustration we experience from the fact that a magician's effects are readily apparent to us, while their methods are not. Indeed, after watching a magic trick, the first question we often ask is, how did he do that? And while the answer to this question may satisfy our curiosity, it only focuses on what is done on the stage leaving open what I think is a much more interesting question. What is it about my eyes, brain, and mind that let me be fooled by the trick in the first place? Why is it that we are sometimes prone to see what isn't there, to miss what is right before our eyes, or to remember things that didn't happen? What is it about our psychology that makes magic possible? And these are some of the questions that we're going to be exploring today. Now, when we think about the psychology of magic, there are three major factors for us to consider. What we see, what we pay attention to, and what we remember. These are fundamental cognitive processes that work together to determine our conscious experiences. Most of the time, they work well together, and we experience a rich and sensible world around us. But every so often, they can lead us astray, leading to illusion, misdirection, and deception. Determining the circumstances under which we can observe these failures is a powerful way for psychologists to discover the inherent properties of the mind and how it works. In fact, when I teach my courses on cognition, I do really start with that trick I just showed you on the first day. It's a method that is as simple as it gets, and any one of you can master it with just one or two minutes of practice. However, tackling the psychology of that trick takes us about five weeks of discussion. And the explaining the trick is essentially the student's task on their first exam. For a modest fee, you can come and see me every Tuesday and Thursday into Bartolo Hall and get all the answers. But in our short time together this afternoon, I'll give you a sneak peek behind that curtain by sharing with you some of my favorite illusions and demonstrations that I hope are going to leave you with a better sense of how your mind works, as well as how we at Notre Dame are using the lessons we learn from magic to, uh, uh, to apply to real world problems in our communities. So let's start our story today by talking about illusion. We've all heard and probably used the old adage that seeing is believing. It implies that there is no doubt about the existence of something when we can directly see it. One of the most important lessons we learn from illusions, however, is that there's a difference between the physical world, that which objectively exists in nature, and the psychological world, the one that we subjectively experience. In fact, it's not difficult to trick you into seeing things that aren't there, like the flashing black dots that seem to appear, randomly click in, in and out of existence in the white circles, or the spinning motion that you might see here that actually is not present. This is a static image. It's also not difficult to make the world vanish before your eyes. If you stare very carefully at the X in the center of this image, you can, for a moment, put yourself in Wonderland with Alice and witness the Cheshire cat slowly disappear, leaving only his grin. Just move your eyes a little bit, and he's back again. Now, a common question people ask when they see illusions like these is why would millions of years of evolution produce a brain that is so easily tricked? And the key to answering this question is the very use of the word tricked in the question itself. A trick, by definition, is some crafty device intended to deceive or cheat. A trick is unusual. It's in defiance of normal practice. But the eye and the brain evolved not for the purposes of avoiding the unusual, but instead to process normal occurrence. Magic and illusion find the small loopholes among the many predetermined ways that we process and interpret the world that most of the time allow us to function appropriately. 
In fact, each of these illusions that I've shown you up here arises from a perceptual mechanism that you are very thankful to have. But at the same time, we can see that these mechanisms can lead to wrong conclusions about the world around us. Now, the circumstances under which illusions are perhaps most frequent and evident in everyday life arise from our need to reach conclusions from insufficient data. When the three-dimensional world projects onto our two-dimensional retinas, a lot of information is lost. From the brain's point of view, then, the information we collect with our eyes has a degree of inherent ambiguity that it is charged with sorting out. To do so, our brain relies on past experiences collected over personal and evolutionary timescales to help us make sense of the world. We could spend an entire afternoon talking about the perceptual biases, but let's take a look at one. Let's take a look at the ways in which our brain uses light and shadow to help it decode the properties of the physical world with one of my favorite illusions. Take a look at these two images. You likely recognize the one on the left as a photograph of the moon. But what about the image on the right? In contrast to the moon's cratered surface, most people perceive this image to be a, a depiction of lumpy or bumpy, bubbly surface of some kind. This perception, however, is easily changed if I simply turn this picture upside down. You might need to blink or glance away from the screen and back again to reset your perception, but when you do, you can now see that it is exactly the same photograph of the moon on the left. And if I turn it back again, the bubbles are back. Our different perception of these two situations is actually easy to explain if we think about how our brains evolved to interpret light and shadow. Our typical experience in both natural and man-made environments is light comes from a source that's somewhere above us. Because, of this because this regularity hasn't changed in over uh, millennia, our brains have evolved to use this fact to help it decode three-dimensional space projected onto a two-dimensional image. When you look at these photographs, notice that on the left, the lower portions of the circles are bright where the upper portions are in shadow. And on this side, we have exactly the opposite case where the brighter portions are on the top and the darker portions are on the bottom. If for a moment we imagine taking a side view of a three-dimensional surface, we can see that light from above leaves a shadow at the top of craters and at the bottom of bubbles. And this is exactly then why your brain decodes these images as it does. Now the richness of information that's present in light and shadow can also be shown in the ways we use them to interpret color. If you look at this figure, you likely perceive region A as being much, dark, uh, being much darker than region B. And in fact, they're exactly the same color. Uh, now before I prove it, let's explain it. With light coming from above, region A is in bright light, while region B is in shadow. Our brains compensate for this lighting difference as a result and assumes that the lower region must be brighter than the upper region in order for it to reflect the same amount of light into our eyes. Indeed, if I remove information from the image about light and shadow, the two regions suddenly look the same. And if I take that information and put it back, the illusion returns. Our brain's use of light and shadow to interpret the world is one example of its ability to recognize and exploit stable patterns in the environment. But the mind's recognition and use of pattern isn't limited to evolutionary tuning to physical regularities. Our own experiences with the world also bias us to interpret what we're seeing. Consider this blurry image of what could probably best be described as a nondescript blob. But if we put this blob into various contexts, our story changes. If I take this exact image and I put it in this one, what do we now think this is a picture of? Shout out some ideas. Shoes, all right. What if I put it in here, same blob? A cup, bottle, a glass or a bottle of soda, something like that. What about over here? A person, a car, right? It's exactly the same thing in both of those cases. Uh, so suddenly, when I do this, the nondescript blob becomes a blurry object that, in fact, many of us in this room can just readily agree on. This reflects a bias toward perceiving meaningful patterns rather than random shapes. 
This is why, incidentally, we so easily see animals in the clouds and find Jesus in our dinner. <laughs> Speaking of which, Mass will be celebrated 30 minutes after today's game in the Sacred Heart and at DeBartolo Hall. All right. Okay. The context in which we perceive objects is not limited to the information in the environment alone. Stereotypes, expectations, and emotions all influence the way we perceive the world. And for a moment, I want to switch to a more serious topic that we're considering at Notre Dame, in which our own behaviors influence our perceptions. Every year in America, hundreds of people fall victim to accidental shootings. And some portion of these occur when the shooter intentionally fires upon an unarmed individual. Now, these are terrible and often highly publicized events that leave us wondering what caused them and what could have been done to prevent them. And the causes of these errors are undoubtedly complex and multifaceted, but what we want to know is whether or not they might sometimes have a basis in misperception. So to find out, we asked people to come to our lab and to look at pictures of actors on a computer screen. And some of these actors were holding firearms, and some of them were holding benign objects like soda cans and cell phones. Each participant was to tell us as quickly as they could whether the actor was holding a gun or not. Now, just as our actors were either armed or not, so too were our participants. I don't know if you can see it very well, but she's holding a handgun. We found that when participants were given firearms, they made more mistakes because they were more likely to think that the objects in an actor's hands were guns when they weren't. Thus, it seems that people have a hard time separating their thoughts about what they perceive and their thoughts about what they can do in terms of their actions. And this confluence of perception and action can bias a person's interpretation of objects in dramatic ways. We have a long way to go with this particular research project, but one major question we now have to ask is how could we reduce these misperceptions and perhaps reduce the prevalence of accidental shootings in our country? Okay, so let's wrap up our discussion of illusion and misperception by returning to the adage that I began with, seeing is believing. On the one hand, I think that we've seen that this is an apt saying in the sense that our perceptions are, in fact, beliefs about the environment that are supported by the inferences that we make. Our physiology, experience, and actions bias us to perceive the world in certain ways in an effort to interpret as accurately as we can the ambiguity that we face. Yet our beliefs are sometimes wrong, and so it may be more apt to title our first lesson today, Seeing is Sometimes Falsely Believing, which is a truth many magic tricks exploit. Now, while opening our eyes is an important part of conscious experience, it's not the only ingredient. In everyday life, we're faced with more information than we could look at or think about. And to compensate for this, we make decisions and choices about the specific sensations, locations, and thoughts that we want to pay attention to and which we want to ignore. This afternoon, I am going to want to watch football players on a field and not the people climbing up and down the concourse stairways. And this evening, I may want to sit and pay attention to Mahler's Second Symphony and ignore a nearby conversation. Right now, I want to be thinking about this talk and not the lunch that's waiting for me outside. Now, perhaps the most important methods in a magician's toolkit are those intended to misdirect our attention, to turn our intentions around and to push us to focus on things that we don't want to think about. And that's surprisingly easy to do. Each shape I'm about to show you contains a vertical or a horizontal line. And when I present them, I want you to find the line inside the green circle and determine if it's horizontal or vertical. Are we ready? Ta-da! Okay, you're all wondering what, okay, that wasn't exciting. Um, but let's try, let's try the second example. That wasn't too hard. Are we ready for example two? And here we go. All right. Uh, so in this second example, again, not a difficult task, but raise your hand if you looked at that red diamond. All right? and it's probably the first thing many of you looked at. The question is, why would you do that? Is it green? Is it a circle? It's not what I asked you to look for. 
Regardless, most people do attend to the red diamond because it's markedly different from the other objects. And in this case, it has a unique color and shape. Now, researchers term uh, the, this kind of effect attention capture. And it describes situations in which the properties of an object grab our attention seemingly against our will. Now, even though attention capture can distract us from what we want to be doing, it does have an important uh, function in our lives. I spoke earlier of perceptual biases that guide our interpretation of the world. Well, here's an example of an attentional bias that is meant to ensure our safety and survival. Conspicuous things like odd colors, sudden movement, and loud sounds capture attention because they are often warning signs of impending danger, like the errant footballs that might come streaking toward your head from the neighboring tailgate party. So why is misdirection so important in magic? The answer is that by moving our attention toward some things, we take it away from others. And these shifts of attention are not without consequence. Let's experience this together by watching the following commercial produced in the United Kingdom as part of a public campaign for bicycle safety. Watch carefully. Somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Oh, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Now, when people see demonstrations like this, they're usually quite surprised that so much of the world can change without their notice. For this reason, it's not surprising that London Transport used this demonstration ahead of their tagline message, it's easy to miss something you're not looking for, so look out for cyclists. Psychologists refer to this as change blindness. It arises in part because the brain assumes that by and large the world is a stable and relatively unchanging place. Hence, after a quick, around, a quick look around our environment to orient ourselves to our surroundings, we usually don't give them much of a second thought. We instead focus on things that are more interesting and less stable, like the movement of actors and the dialogue that's taking place. That said, our assumptions regarding environmental stability means that our experience of a coherent world sometimes stems from a false reality. Awareness is not merely derived from the information that makes it into our eyes, but also by the information we decide to attend to. Let's consider one final example of the consequences attention has on our experience. Watch the following video carefully and follow along with the narrator's instructions. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But, did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! All right, how
How many of you missed it? All right, in lab-based studies in which this demonstration is based, more than 50% of people typically are completely oblivious to objects like our moonwalking bear. In contrast to our change blindness example, however, the bear is clearly interesting, dynamic, and positively unstable. So why did so many of you miss it? Well, the answer lies again in the trade-offs associated with attention. On the plus side, carefully attending to the players in white allowed you to accurately perceive their actions. But to do so, you needed to suppress distracting information from your awareness. In the, this case, the players in black. Your attempts to ignore the players in black fanned out to include all black objects, including our moonwalking black bear. Sometimes the cost of paying attention to one thing is a lower ability to perceive objects and events outside the scope of our cares. So we can now see how the magician who can control our attention can control our consciousness. Now the consequences of inattention for awareness extend well beyond the magician stage. One way in which we are looking at the real world consequences of inattention is in the domain of learning. As you would imagine, learning outcomes are tied very strongly to the attentional states of a student. Students who pay attention to their instructors and their course materials learn, whereas students who are distracted, who daydream, or who focus their attention on things like their text messages or their Fortnite kills, are less likely to achieve deep comprehension. So to be better learners, we need to be better attenders. Now teachers know this, uh, and so when they're teaching students in their classroom, they're constantly monitoring their students' level of focus, and they can adapt their instruction accordingly. They might change the activity, insert a break, go to another topic, call on an individual student to ask a question, all to sort of refresh people's attentions and engage them in what we're doing in the classroom. While these options are all effective, students are increasingly learning in virtual classrooms led by some form of artificial intelligence rather than a human teacher. In fact, nationally, 25% of all college students are enrolled in at least one online course. Now, these educational technologies are programmed to deliver content to students and to assess their learning through a series of tests and quizzes and other activities, but they do so under the assumption that the student is always paying attention. They're unable to detect a student's level of boredom and distraction. If a student stops paying attention, a computer has no way of knowing this. And so it can't provide the kind of dynamic instruction that we just talked about. If we're going to use technology to facilitate learning, we should make this technology as effective as possible. So in a partnership with computer scientists, we are developing learning technologies that can sense and respond to students' attentional states as a means to improve their focus in learning. As an initial step in this direction, we've partnered with biology teachers at Penn High School in Mishawaka, a school of 3,500 students that's located about eight miles east of our campus. Students in these classrooms are supplementing their in-class teacher-led instruction with a typical intelligent tutoring system in which an avatar provides lectures on topics such as carbohydrate function, facilitated diffusion, and biochemical catalysts. These lectures are followed by a variety of online activities that reinforce that lecture content. Our innovation was to install small cameras on students' laptops that monitor their eyes and faces. This is what it kind of looks like to the computer when it takes those pictures. Through a variety of psychological methods and machine learning techniques, we've been able to link various eye movements and facial gestures to students' attentional states. For instance, when students start daydreaming and stop paying attention to the learning content, they blink more. They're more erratic when it comes to choosing what to look at, and they tend to stare at things longer than usual. By detecting these shifts in behavior in real time, our tutoring system is able to predict whether or not a student is, is paying attention or starting to daydream. Here are those predictions for three different students. Our first student seems to be completely engaged throughout the entire learning uh, lesson as we're not seeing any increases in predicted distraction. Our second student's also pretty good, only appears to be distracted occasionally, especially later in the, uh, the lesson that they're engaged in. 
And our third student looks to have difficulty paying attention to the lecture, with our model predicting that he or she is distracted about half the time. Now, what's more important than knowing how well students pay attention while working in virtual classrooms is knowing what we can do about it when they start to lose interest. So in our technology, when the computer thinks there is a high likelihood that the student has stopped paying attention, it triggers one of several pre-programmed interventions to reorient students to their lessons. Here is one example in which the avatar calls the student by name, reminds him that the content being covered is important, and then proceeds to repeat the information it suspects the student may have missed. Well, hormones travel through the body and tell the body how to behave. James, please pay attention. This is important. Well, hormones travel through the body and tell the body how to behave. These hormones can tell your body to do things like grow. It turns out that proteins students, hey, I'm giving this talk, can you go get a real, this is real, this happened, can you go, can you go get one of these things so I can show you, and, I, and they came back with this one, and I'm, I'm, I think they intentionally told James wasn't paying attention, I wonder what they, what, they, what they think of me and what I'm paying attention to them. All right, but we're hoping that by uh, bringing awareness of a student's attentional state into the virtual classroom, that we'll be able to keep students engaged and improve the quality of student learning in these environments. Okay, one last methodological tool in a magician's arsenal is the ability to tamper with observers' memories for what they actually saw. You might not typically think about the importance of memory in magic, but it does play a central role. So let's explore some of the properties of memory that magicians take advantage of. And so for these next demonstrations, you'll need your Saturday Scholar's workbook sheet and pencil. So go ahead, get those out now, and if there are desks on the side of your chairs, if you would like something to write on, and then we'll continue. All right. Okay. Are we ready to go on? Ready, set. When we open our eyes, we see. It's just automatic. However, the creation of memory requires a great deal more effort. Events are not simply passively recorded by our brains. We instead have to expend some work to create memories, and like all things work-related, they require time. You can easily experience this firsthand by watching the intro to the TV show The Big Bang Theory. For any of you unfamiliar with this show, first, you should become familiar with it. And second, the intro segment displays 109 photographs, in 10 seconds. I want you to watch this carefully and then see how many of these you can remember and write down on your pages. I'm seeing a lot, like, you want me to do what? <laughs> you know, we don't even have to write them down, okay? This, was, uh, this is hard. It's not easy. Um, our brains, here they are, by the way. Uh, our brains can recognize objects very quickly. And so when you watch that clip, we don't ever feel a sense of confusion over what it is that we're seeing. But it can't create memories that quickly. In order to improve memory, we need to slow down the rate at which the world changes. So here's just a piece of the longer clip, which I'll play four times slower. All right, so that's still pretty fast. No one would expect you to be able to remember them all, but I think you may have an impression that you could at least write something down if you wanted to. All right. Uh, so, if a magician wants to keep you from remembering some of the details that you might have seen, she's helped by moving quickly. If you can't remember things well, she is more able to alter your awareness and experience. Now, misremembering is a fact of life. Now, while it's tempting to think of memory as a video recorder, preserving the moments of our lives in clear and unalterable form, this is far from the truth. 
Let's try this. I'm going to show you a picture for a few seconds. When it appears, I want you to draw it as best as you can from memory. I will not be collecting these, so uh, even if I did, I am no artist. But here we go. Is everybody ready? It's only going to come up for a few seconds, and we're going to take some time to draw. Okay. Give it a shot. At this point, I can tell the Picassos from the Monets. Picasso. Monet. All right. Are we good enough? Can we move on to this? All right. OK, so here is the picture that I showed you. Um, how many of you, by the way, drew ducks? How many of you drew rabbits? OK. Most people draw rabbits. A few people draw ducks. Some people are confused still. But if you think about this as an animal facing to the left, you may see a rabbit. And if you think of it facing to the right, you may see a duck. What's interesting is not the animal you decided to draw, but how your interpretation altered your memory for what I showed you. When we recall events, we tend to distort them toward our expectations. So if you drew a rabbit, I suspect you did at least one of a few things. You may have rounded the ears. You may have shifted the whiskers to come up more toward this protuberance that you might have thought was a nose. You may have redrawn the chest in the back to be more rabbit-like. If you drew a duck, the shape of the beak may be more typical of birds. That protrusion in those hairs may be completely gone. Uh, and once again, the body lines may be somewhat altered. By a show of hands, how many of you altered your pictures in at least one of these ways? There we go. It works. OK. So while it's clear that memory can be altered in this way, you might be thinking that it's a minor sin at best. After all, you intended to draw a rabbit, and you did. So let's try something else. I'm going to read you a list of words. When I'm done, I want you to write down as many of those words as you can remember. Are we ready? Flour, toast. Jam, milk, rye, loaf, sandwich, eat, butter, slice, dough, crust, food, wine, and jelly. OK, uh, here is the list of words that I read. I'm not so interested in how many you got right, but I am interested in whether any of you wrote down words that are not on my list. How many of you wrote down the word bread? Raise them high, show it off, be proud. You made a mistake. <laughs> Don't feel bad, about half of people do. This is an example of a false memory, a memory for something that didn't happen. In this case, the false memory came about because recollections often include similar associated things, and bread is very associated with each thing on my list. Now, although this is an admitted, admittedly mundane memory test, results from experiments like this show that a person's memory for an event cannot be taken as conclusive evidence that the event actually occurred. Now, stepping off the stage and into the real world one last time, where all this might matter the most is in the realm of eyewitness testimony. Let's see once again how observant you were a little while ago when you saw the video of poor Lord Smythe's demise. Although his wife committed the crime, the main character, who you likely paid the most attention to, was the detective. Which of these men was the detective? Let's go with a voice vote. If I point at your guy, just say, yay, and we'll see where we go. So this guy. OK, excellent. 
or I don't know who did it. Although most of you may have had a little trepidation in doing so. I heard a lot of yays coming out of the audience. So you were willing to pick someone, even as part of a lecture on the errors of memory. <laughs> but the answer is none of them. This guy here was the butler. And these guys took me a good hour of image Google searching to find folks that might look somewhat like our detective. The point is, sometimes our memories can be driven by suggestion. In this case, by the photographs I chose to show you. An innocent enough outcome in this room, but just imagine the potential consequences in a police station or courtroom. So there you have it. A short tour through the workings of your mind and some of the reasons magic is possible and why we sometimes see what isn't there, miss what is right before our eyes and remember things that didn't happen. Taking advantage of our cognitive limitations can surely be a source of delight and amazement. But I also hope that you can see from some of the work that we're doing here at Notre Dame how understanding our limitations can help us overcome them. As for the stage, I hope you will always appreciate the great artistry and ingenuity on display in a good magic act. But understand that in the end, the real magician is the one that hides in our heads. Thank you. I guess we open for questions at this point, right? Okay. Yes, sir. I have not, and I have no desire to be. <laughs> Although I hear you get a pretty good, pretty good stipend for doing so. Yeah. So uh, there are there are certainly people that are that are expert wit uh, expert witnesses for for testimony about the reliability of memory and eyewitness things and that sort of that sort of deal. Um, I don't really have any interest in, in doing that. I would rather uh, try to understand the psychology behind things generally than try to go in there and swear. One thing we couldn't I could never do is go in and, and sort of swear under oath that misperception of the firearm is exactly why this particular event occurred. Right? We're speaking in generalities and statistical likelihoods of how the mind might be biased or not, but we can never say in any individual instance why any particular thing happened. Yes, sir? So the old axiom, uh, perception is reality is true, at least in your mind. In, in your own subjective reality, right. So, uh, you know, another way that with students we can, we can talk about the difference between reality and perception is just with color perception. The reason that we see colors as we do is because our eyes are built the way they are. So the, the electromagnetic spectrum of, of energy is far wider than what we call our visible spectrum. And different animals can see different wavelengths of light that we can't. Their reality, their subjective reality, is going to be very different than ours. In the, in the word retention game, I noticed that the words I listed were the beginning words and the ending words. Yeah, is that the way the that's very works? typical. It's something that psychologists refer to as the recency effect and the primacy effect. And so that means that if you're going to be memorable, you want to be first or last. You don't want to be in the middle. All right. <laughs> that joke worked really well for me once. I had to go give an interview in Brussels to get my uh, European Research Council grant, and they, they, it was an interview process. And I was the last person in the interview day, and that's how I opened it, and I got $750,000. So. <laughs> Um, yes, the way the reason that that works is obviously the recency, the last things you hear, you're going to remember better because of the last things are right in your mind. You haven't gotten distracted away from them yet. The things we remember first is because it, when you first get the words coming, you can rehearse them in your mind more. Because when I say flower, you can sit there and go flower, 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 flower. And I say rye, go flower, rye, flower, rye, flower, rye, right? But as that list gets longer, it gets harder to do that. And that's why the, the words in the middle start to get lost. Similar studies going on with respect to audio perception? There are. I don't know what they are. But there are people that, um, there, there's certainly uh, with uh, things like attention capture, sounds will do that. So if some big, you know, some big crash, everybody's done that in the restaurant, the waitress unfortunately drops everybody's food, and what does everyone in the restaurant do? Right, we go and we turn, we look at that. Um, so what we're doing in my lab was we're just starting right now to think about how does 
uh, sight and sound blend together. I have a senior, uh, Joanne um, uh, Kim, who is doing her senior thesis right now on that. She's also a, she's a neuroscience and behavior major as well as a music major. and She's a piano player. And so what we're doing right now is we are having people, we use the eye trackers, we can see what people are looking at in the world. And now we're doing it along with playing different types of music. And music has different kinds of rhythms and tones and these sorts of things that uh, we're trying to look at how we take what we're hearing and blend with what we're seeing and maybe look at the world in different ways. I don't have any of these answers yet, but we're starting to look at that problem. List. The first word you said was flower, and yeah. the first thing I thought was F L O W E R. Yeah. And then after you gave the rest of the list, I actually wrote down F L O U R. So I guess that because I associated it with the rest. Right. Yeah. I need to get somebody else told me that exact same thing last time I did this. I really need to make that not the first word on the list. Uh, but uh, yeah, because someone said oh, I actually wrote down F L O W E R. W E R and see how many people. Uh, see how many people, people. Yeah, make a mistake. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yes, sir. Are there environments or techniques that are especially effective for avoiding distraction? For avoiding distraction, yeah. So um, a quiet room would probably be one. The, the, the problem is, the question is, really, what kind of distraction are you trying to avoid? So if I were studying by myself in my office or library or something, I may reduce the distractions that I might have of my environment. But I haven't gotten rid of the fact that we are really bad at just being, you know, working at something diligently for a long time. We start to daydream, all right? That's a distraction. Um, and so uh, you never can really escape from it, I don't think. But of course, if depending on the kind of task you're doing, if you can uh, put yourself in an environment where you would have the least amount of stuff competing for your attention, uh, then you'd be better off. You, uh, like David Blake, when he's in the street with 10 people, I mean, why is their perception all the same then? I mean, I... I, I mean, he's I, very, I very it. good at what he does. Mm -hmm. I was actually, uh, my wife and I went to Las Vegas a year or two ago, um, and we went to go see David Copperfield. All right, and so I spent the entire show, like, all right, he wants me to do that. I'm going to do this instead. Still couldn't figure it out. And then he throws these balls into the audience. And he says, whoever catches these balls gets to come up on stage and be in a trick. And I caught one. I was in the trick. I, it was a trick where the audience is up here, curtain comes up, we vanish and appear in the back. I can't tell you how it was done. I was in it. They're very, very good at what they do. They understand exactly these kinds of principles that we were talking about here about how your expectations and your psychology and your mind and your eyes and your brain work, and they find all of those loopholes into exactly how they do it. One of the things that David Copperfield, he came and talked to us afterwards, they said, oh, uh, stay over here, a senior technician will come in and tell you about the trick. Well, and then David Copperfield walks in, and he's got these poster boards, and David Copperfield talks about a mile, you know, 3,300 words a minute, he's going through, he's like, well, here's how the trick went, or maybe that's not right, maybe it's how this one went, and then, the, well, maybe that's it, maybe this is how we did it, but he's doing is he's throwing tons of information, so that when we walk out, we can't remember the difference between what we saw and did, versus all the different ways that he thinks we could have done it. Every single thing in those tricks is done for a reason. There is nothing left to chance um, when, when the professionals do it. The lady behind you. Um, in your study with the firearms and the confusion over and the yeah. bias of someone actually holding a firearm, did you find a similar bias in folks who had done the test repeatedly, whether they became better or worse because of predicting or being used to seeing the shapes? Yeah, so we, we, we look at, you can look at that, the way, the way we did look at it is you can kind of look at what mistakes you make early in the experiment versus late, because they're seeing lots of these pictures over and over and over again. Uh, not the same picture, but we have, a hundred of these pictures or something. Um, and we didn't see in that space of time any change between the early and the late. Uh, that doesn't mean that on a broader scale that that wouldn't be changed. So one thing that we want to do, um, we've, uh, Notre Dame Security Police Department's been extremely supportive of those kinds of experiments that we've been doing. We want to get to the point where we can partner with them and look at things like police officers who have extensive training and see how does that change. Or we could, uh, we've been tr trying to think about partnering with the ROTC programs, where you can look at students who are coming in as first-year students who, and fourth-year students that would have different amounts of experience with firearms and training and that sort of thing. Uh, we don't know the answers. I, I can't tell you if there's a way you can train this out. I hope that you can, but we don't have the answer to that yet. 
Down front. So you never showed us your magic trick. You never. You I did show you the magic trick behind that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we'll add, I'll show it to you right before we leave. Okay. <laughs> so let's do the other questions, and then and then we can uh, we can do that. I think I brought, a, brought another deck. I have like six decks up here, so that if my daughter was right and screwed this up, <laughs> we could. The, the answer is I'm going to prepare this one here. You actually have to stack the deck, so let me stack it quick. But other questions? Anyone else have another question while I while I do this? I have another real question. Yeah, you have a real you have a real question. I have a question. So you said, I okay. Magic trick. Oh. <laughs> I was really expecting that to be question number one. So, how <laughs> um, so you know, we know that. Eyewitness testimony isn't always reliable. Like, are there more, are there better ways to get reliable testimony, or is, is the there are. kind of that we shouldn't ever do it? No, there are, and that's actually a huge research endeavor. Is how do we do this so that we don't go ahead and and get people um, to to be tricked into the, the biases that they have? Um, and so, uh, there's an entire science to that um, that that people get into. Um, you know, you don't want to do things. Uh, it, it can be subtle. You know, you can. Um, uh, you don't. Want, I mean, there used to be times when you would take the suspect and, and you'd put him in the lineup, and you'd go take five dudes that look nothing like him, and then it's like, oh, well, we picked that guy. Well, of course you do, right? Because it was completely stacked. So there's there's ways with cognitive interviews and these other sorts of things that people do that that endeavors. How do we try to get good information? Uh, versus bad information. One of the things that you have to do that seems to be really powerful is you don't let witnesses talk to each other. Um, and so uh, one of the first things that police will do if they come to a crime and there's witnesses is they want to get them as separated from each other as possible uh, so that they're not talking to each other like, oh, well, you know, what'd you see and what'd you see? And it's like David Copperfield all again. No one knows what, what they saw. Um, and so uh, uh, if you have five people that all saw it, and you know, one person says red shirt, somebody else says green shirt, someone else says blue shirt, you've got no information about the shirt. If everybody says six feet tall, 150 pounds, blue shoes, and they all say that, you're probably pretty good on knowing that that's good information. We have over here, yeah? The time limits from the time you witness an event, and then uh, how long does it take to, you know, before your memory wanes and what you actually saw? Yeah, it, it's, it can certainly, it can, it not only can it, be, can it wane, it, be, it can be changed, right? So you see something, there's a, another way, a lot of experiments uh, have been done. You give witnesses some information, and then you let them go away, and then they watch news reports. They, they read newspapers, they see online uh, news coverage. Uh, and so all of that clouds your memory, and it becomes what did I see versus what did I hear about later? Uh, and so, yeah, you want to try to get as much information from people as soon as possible to try to avoid those kinds of problems. Um, but what also happens is your confidence can go up in your mistakes. So if you make a mistake, say, oh, so-and-so had a red shirt on, all right, and then the next detective says, what color was the shirt? And maybe you're not so sure. Well, maybe it's red. Well, the next person asks, red. And you're in a courtroom. The lawyer asks, what color was the shirt? You've told them that it's a red shirt so many times that you might have started with, eh, I'm not so sure, and you end up with absolutely. Right, uh, and so those are all, they're hard to combat because they're natural tendencies of the way that we work and the way that our memories play. Um, and so you, you have that, that kind of problem. Um, okay, so do we have one more and then I'll do the trick and then I think you all need to go find, find a drink and a sandwich for these guys. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. So there's a book, The Merchants of Doubt, where historians of science look at the way that certain scientists manufacture doubt about the effects of smoking, acid rain, global warming, and so forth. And they made the book into a movie, and in it they're making the uh, uh, object that magicians always trump scientists. So if you have a scientist that's trying to manufacture doubt through deception and so forth, the scientists have a hard time competing against that. So how do we as a democracy uh, root those things out? Wow, I should have just shown you the trick. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting question. You know, it's, it is a case. Magicians, you know, there's, there's an art to this, right? If you go and you talk to professional positions, um, uh, musicians, magicians, they, uh, they can tell you, you know, how they're going to do it, but 
I can tell them how exactly it worked. So there, there is kind of a partnership there. I just wish I could do more magic than I do. All right, so here's the trick. I actually do show this to my students at some point. Did I screw this up already? Yes. Come on. Two threes. I need two twos, not a two and a four. Oh, okay. There you go. I should get make you come up here and do it. You kind of took my class, or you kind of... <laughs> All right, so uh, you got to stack the deck. So my top two cards, I just got a two of spades and a three of clubs, okay? And then my next card is the three of spades, and my bottom card is the two of clubs. So you can see that they're the opposites, right? And so if I go ahead and burn these two cards, and you can put them wherever in the deck you want to, and when you throw these, the top and bottom cards sort of stick to your fingers. And so they just kind of hang out there. Um, and so one of the great things is about this trick that's something we didn't talk about today is that everyone believes what they're seeing at the end is exactly what they saw when they started, and it's not. Because I just threw away the two of uh, spades and the three of clubs, and I'm showing you the exact opposite here. People are really good when you don't give them a lot of time, remembering that they saw a two and a three, a spade and a club. To put that together takes a greater effort of memory. And so you don't sit up here like, well, okay, you guys want to study this for a while, right? You walk across the room, you don't give them time. And so there's an example of how, by limiting what you can create in memory, I can convince you that you saw things that you never saw. So thank you very much. Enjoy the game. Go Irish.